dream last night, uh, one of my dreams, that I came to church. And you know why I know it was a dream? It's because in that particular episode, Mike was clean shaven. He did not have a beard. <laughs> uh, I didn't recognize him at first. And I, he had to introduce himself. <laughs> so that was different. So I don't know what that means, but I'm not sure why I'm dreaming about you either. So. <laughs> But anyway, Shem or Shem. <laughs> For those of you familiar with the Stooges, uh, Samuel Horwitz, the one in the middle, is Moe's older brother. Uh, his mom spoke a thick Yiddish accent, and so it sounded like Shem when she was actually saying Sam. Uh, you probably recognize the younger brother of them, uh, Curly probably more so than that, but uh, when I first thought of, started reading about Shem, I thought of Shem, and so I just had to share that with you, so I apologize for that if you don't appreciate that. <laughs> um, you know, there's been, over the centuries, there's been a tremendous uh, speculation about the history of man, and the evolution of man as we've learned about it of course we this is maybe a newer slide where we get back to something like an ape i guess but um it's really unnecessary to think about evolution evolution is a is a man created idea of we originated from well they said a monkey then you got how you got to go back further than that to a a, a single cell amoeba and that we all came from that and it somehow it formed and crawled out of the, out of the water and onto the earth and things like that. But my question has always been, where did the single cell amoeba come from? Something originated, something had to originate. And Genesis gives us a detailed explanation, a simple explanation, where we don't have to think about, did I come from a monkey? And I know some of us look, maybe look like that, but do we really originate from that? And so Genesis gives us a complete historical record of man from Adam, the very first Adam, up through Abraham, which we're gonna talk about some uh, today, and then of course to Jesus, and then to us where we're at uh, today. Um, God's covenant people are going to be established as his witness. Almost like on a trial situation where witnesses takes the stand and explains. That's what Israel was supposed to do. To take the stage of the world and explain um, the one true God and how he exists and how he's real. And remember that the nation of Israel is going to spawn out of or come out of this group of people that got off uh, the Noah's Ark and that established the, the city of Babel or Babel, however you want to pronounce it. And then God scatters them and the witness, the Israel, the nation of Israel is going to be a witness to all those scattered people to trying to draw them back to the true God. And so the rest of the Old Testament is the story of Israel and you can read about that. It talks about things like the death of Joseph, Israel in Egypt, about 1800 BC, comes to the birth of Moses, then who led Israel out of slavery, and so on and on it goes in the Old Testament. The Old Testament closes with about 400 years of silence. There's no prophetic message given until the Messiah comes on the stage and actually John the Baptist pronouncing, here comes the Messiah. And so there's this 400 years of silence and then Jesus is born a couple thousand years ago, and the whole story of man according to the Bible's chronology is now roughly about 6,000 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's not millions of years old, and I dare anyone to prove that by photographs that it's a million years old. <laughs> um, we saw in chapter 10, and we've been, by the way, for those of you that haven't been here, we're, we're going through Genesis chapters 1 through the first part of 12. 
And so we're in chapter 11 now. So we've looked at lots of different things. And in chapter 10 and the first part of 11, we saw that Noah's descendants were scattered from Babel or Babel all over the world because God uh, confused their language and says, you're not going to stay here. I want you scattered. I want you around the world. And so they collected in various groups who could understand each other and they moved over the face of the earth. One of the important uh, groups of people that we're going to talk about today is Abram, or it's going to be later Abraham, but Abram and his family is scattered down to the lower Mesopotamian Valley in Ur. And I just, as I was sitting here looking over these notes, something came to my mind. I hope it's not too outrageous. I don't think it is, but it's just weird for me to, to think about it. I hope we remember to share that with you at that time. So stay on the edge of your seat. <laughs> so these, these groups scattered all over the world. Now there's a general listing of the genealogies that flow from the sons of Noah. And as we come to chapter 11, verse 10 is where we're going to pick up today. Uh, the focus returns to that lineage, but through Shem specifically, and not in a broad sense like chapter 10 talks about uh, Shem's heritage, but more narrowly focused to the line of promise. And the line of Shem goes directly to Abraham. He's mentioned as Abram here. These na names going to be later changed to Abraham. I guess we're more familiar with Abraham, but um, we're going to see that. And we saw this... Uh, uh, Abraham's going to come come into the picture here. He's the father of Israel. And then it's going to point eventually to Jesus, the most important uh, man in our redemption. Now we've seen throughout uh, Genesis this continuum of paganism versus promise. Paganism is false belief, false practices about God or concerning who God is. And the idea of promise is this idea of a, a declaration leading to some sort of expectation and so we see this as we I think we've seen this develop um, how part of the people followed their own ways their own desires didn't seek after God and then some appeared to be more God godlike or godly uh, we saw this conflict early on between Cain and Abel uh, with the society of Lamech built before the flood how paganism dominated this contrary ideas to God and there was only a few that accepted God and his word and of course they're going to be saved uh, in the flood so the scripture from Genesis to Revelation shows men and women uh, all being sinful every one of us has fallen short uh, Romans tells us and often we are in rebellion against God we're opposed to God we're dead in our sin because of that and we're bound up in in self and who what I can satisfy myself with and, and how I can please myself and my own desires uh, look over in Romans chapter 3 before we get back to Genesis 11 but in Romans 3 I'd like to read a few verses there Uh, that talks about the sinfulness of man in, in verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we all have already, let me back up, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. For it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks, seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. The mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so the universal uh, diagnosis is man is wretched, and that's kind of where we stand. And so we have to have some sort of uh, relief from that, or if we choose to have relief, we don't have to, I guess. But if we want to have relief from that, we come to the Savior uh, for forgiveness and mercy. So man's story really is one of rebellion, but it's also a great promise. 
we have this rich promise of God, you know, back in Genesis 3.15, in the middle of cursing the serpent, the man, the woman, because they ate the forbidden fruit, God said, he made this promise, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, he's speaking to the serpent, and you will strike his heel. And so God reveals here the promise to crush Satan, and Jesus is going to do that when he dies on the cross. He's going to be victorious even in through that death. And so the first promise that God would deliver to sinners is that we're going to have relief and release from that great adversary, uh, the devil. Uh, it's true that mankind chose Satan's word over God's in general, his word view over God's, his leadership. But thankfully, we're not fixed in being separated from God forever in that disastrous condition. And unlike the angels who fell and could never be redeemed, humans are granted promise that someone will come and be victorious. God said back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat uh, from it, you will certainly die. And the reality was spiritual death did set in, did not physical death necessarily, and especially not eternal death. But uh, it's interesting that even though they were condemned, the woman still gave birth. She brought forth life from uh, that relationship with Adam. And that lineage, through her lineage, is going to come this, this one who will crush the serpent. In fact, it's interesting that God, or excuse me, that Adam was so confident uh, that they were going to live that he named his wife Eve, the mother of the living. And he believed the promise that she could produce life, and she did. Chapter 4, Genesis 4, produced Cain and Abel. Yeah. In chapter 3, verse 21, God killed an animal, made garments of skin, a magnificent picture of substitutionary death, and provided this covering for them. And then men began to call on the name of the Lord, chapter 4, verse 6. And so in the midst, midst of disaster and rebellion, fallenness, there is promise promise of something leading to some sort of expectation some sort of reception that we're going to going to have going to enjoy where sin abounds grace much more abounds Romans 5 verse 20 so even in the uh, before God banished Adam and Eve from the garden he gave them a promise that paradise could be regained forever and there were eight souls who also believed that on Noah's ship and from those eight, a new world began. Chapter 9 says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And so through Noah's seed, we're going to have one who's going to bruise the serpent's head. And we're going to see that lineage develop to the revival of Messiah. And so I wanted us to see this continual contrast. Hopefully you have explained it good enough, but... This continual contrast between paganism or the view of here's what I want to do, here's how I want to worship you, God, here's how I believe uh, you exist, and those kinds of things, to how he really is. And so this comparison of promise versus paganism. Uh, God planned to develop a nation to be a witness nation, to go to the world and tell them about redemption, and really we're to carry on that same call. So let's look at the text uh, this morning. We're in Genesis chapter 11. It's a lot of words here, and hopefully I'm not going to uh, take too much time and spend on each of those words, but uh, just want us to see the, the development. This is a geneal genealogical record from Shem to Abraham, or Abram as he's called initially. Uh, so let's, let's note at verse 10. This is the account of Shem's family line. Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxad. And you know, we've talked about, we're going to see, I'm going to show you a slide that has a whole bunch of years on there. And you think, how could people live this long? 100 years, and now he's going to give birth, or he's going to create a child at 100 years old? In today's, we've got to get out of today's thinking, because there was no disease, there was 
very clean lines of uh, genes and passing those things along. And so there wasn't an issue with living long lives. We look at, think about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are just old lizards. They're, they're lizards that have lived for five, 600 years and they just grow and they keep growing. You can look at uh, lizards today uh, until somebody gets rid of them, but they, they just keep growing. And so the years here don't let that alarm you too, too much. I mean, it's interesting to think about for sure. Okay, so he becomes the father of Arphaxid. And after he became the father of Arphaxid, Shem lived 500 years and had other sons and daughters. So you're gonna, you're gonna see, so he's 600 years is his length of life, which is tremendous. But he's had other sons and daughters, so he's re they're repopulating the earth. Uh, when Arphaxid had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And after he became the father of Shelah, Arphaxid lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived uh, 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Shelah lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And after he became the father of Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg lived 30 years, he became the father of Ruah. And after he became the father of Ruah, Peleg lived 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ruah lived 32 years, he became the father of Sarah. And after he became the father of Sarah, yeah. Ruah lived 207 years and had other sons and daughters. Yeah. And when Sarah lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor. And after he became the father of Nahor, Sarah lived 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. After Haran became the father of Lot, while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of their, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was, Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, and son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and the wife of his son Abram, together to set out from Ur to the, of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they had settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. So a huge list of genealogy, and I don't know if any of you like to do genealogies. It's kind of fun uh, to think about where you've come from and your heritage. And uh, sometimes it gets repetitious, sometimes it gets like confusing, and you try and figure it all out. Marcia just discovered uh, well, let me back up just a hair. When we were in Kentucky, we went to a, a Shaker village. If you've heard of the Shakers, they made furniture and all kinds of different stuff. But uh, the Shakers were a very interesting lot, a, a Protestant denomination that uh, got the spirit and they shook and they became known as the Shakers. They didn't start out calling themselves that, but that's what they became. And, and Marcia found a letter from her mother uh, that one of her relatives was part of this group. And so I just sent you a link, by the way, uh, to do some research on this. So it's interesting how we could look at our genealogy and our record of how we got to this point today. How, why are you sitting right here today? And you can look back through your genealogy and figure out ways to get you here. And it shows you ways to get here. And so that's what we've read about. And some of it seems outrageous with these years, the dates of these years and these things. But it's just showing us this is the genealogy. This is what happened as we, until we get to Abram. And so uh, Abram's family, I want you to see, his family was pagan. His family did not believe God. They were part of the group that scattered from the Tower of Babel. Remember when God scattered them? They were part of the group that went down south in the lower Mesopotamian Valley to the, the town of Ur. And that's where they settled. That's where they developed and probably were founders, the founding members of that group, right? And so that's where their 
living. They're pagans, they're idolaters. They likely worship the gods of astrology that were invented at Babel. And they seem to have been especially involved in the cult of worshiping the moon god who flourished in ancient Mesopotamia. And we have lots of references uh, for, from the Sumerians and different groups in that area that they worship the moon and especially the moon god or goddess. And to understand something about the family of Abram, and if you turn over to Joshua chapter 24, and just let me give you a few verses here, but to give you a little preview of what's happening here, even after the flood, the development of these families and nations at, at Babel or Babel were pagan in spite of a very recent flood, in spite of having eyewitness testimony because people who got off that boat were still alive, they could tell and share that experience of a flood. By the way, by the way, if you look at Native American groups in the Americas and you look at other groups around the world, they all have creation stories. And it came out of this, it came out of this as they were scattered People had their own view of things and they just developed it and kept going on and kept expanding on it. So anyway, um, even after all that eyewitness testimony, their descendants were pagan. Look over in Joshua 24, uh, verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac and to Isaac, I gave him Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt and so forth, it's gonna go. But just a, a reminder that Abraham's family, they were pagans, they worshiped other gods, not the God of heaven, not the God we read about in the Bible. And so he, his father was an idolater. He served other gods, a pagan in every sense. By Abraham's time, or Abram's time, the whole world, for the most part, was idolatrous. They've scattered. And the world in general still is today. We are a scattered group of people. A lot of people worship false gods. They don't, worship, they don't seek the God of heaven. And we need to do that, though. We need to be like uh, Jonah, who finally came to his senses, and he said, those who worship false gods turn their back on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifice to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. That's Jonah chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And so the glory of God appeared to Abram, and indicating that he was something special, that he believed God, like Noah, through him, maybe not perfectly like we wanted to be perfect, because we're not perfect either. But through him, God's going to shape a nation to tell the world of idolaters about him and try and lead them back to the true and living God. And so we're going to look at really quickly here at verses 10 down through verse 26, the idea of from Shem to Abram. This genealogy, this first section of what we just read, uh, it begins two years after the flood. So you have the flood of Noah. He's, they're on the boat. They get off the boat. Two years later, that's where this genealogy picks up. And it's interesting. There's nothing about death. He lived. He lived. He lived. If you go back to the previous genealogies, this man died, and this one took over. This person died, this one took over. It's all death, death, death. This one's about life. And so in chapter 11, we see he lived, he lived, he lived. And so it marks out life, and that's that contrast between paganism and promise. So we come to this genealogy, 
Uh, it's the genealogy of Peleg because he's the line to Abraham. Okay, I tried to make this a clear slide and I know it's not uh, because I'm not nearly as talented as Paul is. But, and it shows a lot of stuff. And so I just want to take you through it for a second so you see it. So this genealogy we read about, I tried to get them down here in order. Uh, Shem down to Abram. And it's two years beyond the flood. These numbers on the left are the years following the flood. So our fact says he's born two years after. 37 years later, Sheila is born. Uh, 67 years later, Eber is born. So you're gonna, if you can do math faster than I can, you're going to be good. Uh, and so the whole genealogy here that we have is 290 years post-flood, so after the flood. What that red or orange line, whatever color that is, means is that during the life of Peleg, and we're going to see something about this in just a second, so keep, kind of keep that in mind. What's that red, red line about? And let me, let me go on, we'll talk about it. So, in just a second, I'll, so again, be on the edge of your seat. Um, so, interesting tidbits about Shem's descendants. Shem was not Noah's firstborn, typically the most important son, that was Japheth, remember? But this is the line going to Abraham, and that's why we're looking at it, and that's why the Bible puts it in here in very specific terms. Sheila was, used to be, or at least at this point, could be a man's name. Now we think of somebody named Sheila, we think, immediately we think of feminine, uh, but Sheila, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, could have been a man's name in those days. Eber, which is the fourth in this line, uh, that's the term that we get the word Hebrews from, or Hebrew, and so that's where that heritage is going to come through. Peleg, and are you ready for the red line? It signals something very important. Let me go back to chapter 10 in Genesis and verse 25. So just the page before, if I get there. Ten verse twenty five. The sons born to Eber, one was named Peleg, because he because in his time the earth was divided. His brother's name was Joktan. So the earth was divided. What what's that referring to? The Tower of Babel, right? So during his his time, you've got about a hundred, possibly a hundred years after the flood. We don't know exactly when the earth was divided. How old Peleg was? But during his lifetime is when the Tower of Babel scattered people over the face of the earth. And so I thought that was really uh, interesting to think about, uh, thinking about his, his life and during his time, that's, that's going to happen. This scattering is going to occur. All these people are still alive that are before him. Noah's still alive. The family that got off the boat is still alive. Uh, his brother Joktan fathered the Abra, uh, Arab lines, so you're going to see the Arabic, anything that's Arabic is coming through Joktan. But Peleg fathered Israel's ancestry because Abraham is going to be in his descent. Nahor, uh, just a handful of generations from Shem, so it was six or seven, something like that. Um, he only lives a quarter of the time of Shem's life. So you can see the impact of sin, the impact of the flood, the environment's changed, shortening life. Life is getting shorter. Uh, and it's actually on the impact on the increase through medicine and all that kind of stuff, but, and food, good food, but at, for a time it keeps getting shorter and shorter. Now these are names of people in the Old Testament this genealogy uh, sometimes is also places of uh, location. So Terah, the name of Abram's father, was also a place in the northwestern upper Mesopotamian Valley. So establishing maybe a community or something, they name it after the founder. So sometimes that happens as well. 
All right, so that was a really quick, hopefully quick overview of the first section there. Let's talk now a little bit more about uh, Abram's family and down in verse 27 of Genesis 11. So 27 through the end of the chapter. Now, Terah is not a believer in the true God. Joshua 24, too, said that he served other gods. He was idolatrous. He was a pagan. And his three boys, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, are born into a pagan family. And no doubt they're influenced by astrology, that astrology of Babel. It, it appears they worship the moon god. Uh, this moon god has different names, but one of them is, very interestingly, S-I-N. Um, Terra comes from the Hebrew word uh, Yari, uh, I'm, I butchered that I'm sure, but he actually moon, so he's probably named after the moon god or goddess uh, in ancient Mesopotamia. Now Abram, later he's going to be called Abraham, chapter 17, verse 5. His name means exalted father, interestingly. Uh, but Abram, Abraham means the father of nations. So Abram, exalted father, Abraham, father of many nations. His name was exalted father by his parents and given the name father of many nations by God. Nahor was named after his grandfather, and you can see uh, that in his lineage as well. Chapter 22 indicates that Nahor had 12 sons. Each is going to be uh, Abraham's nephews. And one of his brother's sons was Bethuel, the father of, ready, Rebecca, who's going to marry Abraham's son, Isaac, and became the mother of Jacob and Esau, and on and on it goes down that lineage. The third son of Terah was Haran, also the name of a town in Moab, uh, Beth Haran, and you can see that in Numbers chapter 32, verse 36, and Joshua 13, 27. Abram is the key person here because he believed in the true God whose glory appeared. And that's what the book of Acts tells us in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 8. Notice a couple pages later in Genesis 15. Look at 1 through 6. In Genesis chapter 15, that we're not going to get to in our study this year anyway, but maybe someday we'll come back to this. Uh, this is the Lord's covenant with Abram. It says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Ebenezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given, a, given me no children to a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son is your, uh, who is your own flesh and blood will come, become your heir. Back up. Will be your heir. There you go. Uh, he took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Or as righteous. So Abraham's considered righteous because he believes God. And it's interesting that the change that occurs in Abraham's heart, he built, remember his father, named after the moon god, a pagan, worshiping many gods. And now Abram changes, his heart is changed that he now only worships one god, the true god. And it's interesting to see his heart. He believed the Lord and God counted him as righteous and justified him, Romans chapter four, verse three. Uh, God approached Abraham when he was still down in Ur, but certainly he was at least seeking the God of heaven. Haran was the father of Lot, uh, Abraham's brother, remember Haran. Uh, he died while in the presence of his father, literally in his father's face. So I'm, I'm assuming that his father's holding him as he expires, but uh, his father's still alive. And because of this, Lot had to take Haran's place. And so, remember, Lot is Haran's son. Uh, so he's going to, as primogenitor, he's going to take the son's spot, so almost acting like his father. And so Lot takes the place of him. And, and he's going to be treated more like a son than a grandson. 
In fact, Abraham himself is going to, who is his uncle, is going to take him under his wing to the land of Canaan and protect him and, and teach him and train him and live with him. And so since Haran dies before his father Terah did, his son Lot took the place as if he were a son. Now all this occurs in a town called Ur, and we read about it, it says Ur of the Chaldeans. At that time, it would not have been the Chaldeans. Uh, when, when originally Abram was called, it would have been just Ur. But remember that, that um, Abraham is reading this, not Abraham, but Moses is reading this to the Israelites as they're entering Canaan. And he's reminding them that in Ur, remember the, Chal the Chaldeans live there now. It's Ur of the Chaldeans. That's where he sort of references it that way. So it's called those Chaldeans, even though technically at the time it wouldn't have been that. Now, verse 29 says, Abram and Nahor were both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Later, God changed the name of Sarai, which means my princess, to Sarah, which means simply princess. So the Maya is dropped. Why did God do that? Why did God change names? Why did he change her name anyway? She wasn't just going to be anybody's princess, not her daddy's little princess, but she was going to be the, the princess, the, the princess to Abraham uh, to carry on the lineage that's going to go forth uh, towards Messiah. Uh, in the Sumerian language, her name would have been translated as queen, so a princess or a queen Interesting, one of the gods of the ancient Babylonian uh, was Iskar, the goddess of the planet Venus, and she would have been named after her. And so we go back to this astrology again and, and uh, looking at the stars and thinking about these kinds of things. And so they had Mesopotamian cults mixed in with their own ideas. It tells us that Nahor had a wife named Milcah, the daughter of a different Haran, who had two daughters, Milcah and Iska. Milcah means queen again, another name for that, and it's one of the Akkadian titles for the goddess Ishtar again, the queen of heaven. And here's uh, an engraving of the queen of heaven. I'll let you be the judge of whether she's a great queen or not. Um, when the Israelites got into the land of Canaan, they were still profoundly influenced by the worship of the moon god, moon goddess, the queen of heaven, and so forth. Um, idolater, those kinds of things. So uh, in Babylon and Egypt, they all influenced the Israelites. And when the children of Israel are going to get into Egypt, this paganism is really influenced again. And so we see this, the idea of uh, this astrological orientation of these people, thinking up the moon gods, the queen of heaven, those kinds of things. Well, back in Genesis chapter 11, down in verse 30, it says, Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. And this, of course, is the worst possible situation for a woman of that era to be involved in because you were uh, rejoiced in when you had children. People rejoiced in that. And if you were barren, it was almost like you were cursed. Um, thankfully, it's not that way any longer, but that's how it was then. And so this launches the story of Abraham. He's the example of faith for all who will believe. And though he couldn't, she couldn't have a child, Abram believed God when he was told, I will make you into a great nation. And so here's Abram's dilemma. He's supposed to be the father of a great nation. His wife is barren. So what, what do they do? It's just not going to happen naturally. This situation gave opportunity, though, for Abraham to exercise faith in the promise of God. His belief justified him and made him to be the prototype of our faith, Romans chapter 4 tells us. In verse 31, Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, uh, Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarah, the wife of the son, Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Why did they settle there? I think we go back to 
the Tower of Babel, they didn't like moving. They were very homebodies. They wanted to stay in one location, but God scattered them. And now he tells them to go to Canaan, but they go north to Haran, and they settle there. Why'd they do that? I mean, they're, they're comfortable. They're living down in Ur. That's their home. That's their people in Ur. Why'd they leave that place? Acts chapter 7 tells us. So let me get back over there. And this is Stephen's report about, uh, by the way, if you want a history of the Old Testament, look at Acts chapter 7 in Stephen's declaration, and it'll give you a great overview of the Old Testament. But he says there, uh, down in verse uh, 7, Uh, verse 1, then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? So he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. 400 years, uh, your descent, for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in the country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation uh, they serve as slaves. God said, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. And so that's exactly what happened. They left Ur because Abraham received a call from God. And somehow God, or Abraham convinced his father, let's go to Canaan. His father said, okay, we will. We'll go to Canaan uh, from Ur. But notice they didn't go straight west. They followed the rivers, which is a great trade route, and you got water to drink and for your livestock, for you. So they, they traveled north to get south, southwest. And they get to Haran. And here's what I thought about as I was sitting here this morning. It's not on this map, but somewhere in this area, there is where the Tower of Babel was. And I don't know if they passed by the same route. I don't know if they saw the unfinished building or the torn down structure, their old stomping grounds, but I just thought that was a, must be the strangest thing to have been scattered by God and now they are passing by and rem remembering all about that. They get to Haran and the father wants to stop and stay. Tara says, let's stay here. Let's settle here. Haran is another place where the moon god is worshipped. And so it's a familiar place to him. And Abraham's still young enough in life and maturity that he, he's been, he's getting these messages from God, go to Canaan, but he's still under his father's authority and still maybe not quite sure of himself. And so they stay in Haran. And rather than go straight across the desert, they go north up to Euphrates, through the high country and that beautiful well-watered mountains cross over those mountains and eventually eventually they're going to drop down into Canaan but they stop there and they settle there and Terah dies there that's how long they stayed and you know what is unfortunate is that Abram's father Terah named after the moon god the pagan we don't have any record of him changing his thoughts about that he dies of pagan. That's unfortunate. 
for Terah's son Abram, it's going to be different, far different. He will, in deep devotion, seek and call on the God of heaven. Live by faith in the one and only God, the creator of all things. And chapter 12 begins the story of that call of Abraham. We're going to see this, the beginning, the very beginning of the story of redemption that's going to culminate eventually in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and how we can be saved through him. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Hopefully you've gained something. Uh, I know it's been a fun story. Uh, researching it and uh, sharing it with you. So, thanks. If you're not a Christian today, uh, I want to encourage you to uh, make that decision to become one. It's, it's the greatest life possible. Uh, leave, leave your pagan ideas about many gods and focus on the one true God because in Him uh, you can have hope. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. Repent of your sins and turn to Him and be immersed in Him. Uh, and it's a great life. So I encourage you to do so. Let's stand and sing.